So my final speaker for tonight is Dr. Philip Beachy. Dr. Beachy received his PhD from Stanford, and after a time at Johns Hopkins, he joined the Stanford faculty in 2006. He ultimately joined the urology faculty just a few years ago in 2018. He holds the Ernest and Emilio Gallo professorship in urology, and he was a Howard Hughes investigator for 30 years? Long time. Dr. Beachy is director of the Siebel Investigator Program at the Institute of Stem Cell uh, Biology and Regenerative Medicine. He is, and, and Dr. Beachy, uh, up till now you've mostly been hearing from clinician scientists. Dr. Beachy is like a real scientist. He, he is a, a brilliant scientist. So Dr. Beachy is best known for being one of the first people to describe both the function and the biology of something called the hedgehog pathway, which I hope you'll tell us a little bit about. Um, it's a, one of the real keys to both normal development and actually a key to a lot of cancers and, and how they behave. Um, he will tell you how this impacts bladder cancer and some of the exciting things that um, he's doing now in the lab. We are thrilled that he is um, turned his sights on bladder cancer. I think this holds uh, very excitement, a lot of excitement for the future. So I'm going to um, let Dr. Beachy take us from there. Well, thank you, Isla, for that introduction. I really consider my clinical colleagues the real scientists. <laughs> They're the people who are having impact, direct impact on people's health. Um, it really is a pleasure for me to be here and have the privilege of uh, speaking with you all. I'd like to discuss um, two of the major challenges in bladder cancer. Um, uh, and these uh, are the challenges of recurrence and progression. Now, as you may know or may have gathered, the great majority of bladder cancers uh, at diagnosis are non-invasive. They're restricted to the lining of the bladder. They don't enter the tissues, uh, the cells that, uh, that sit underneath. Um, and so they're, they're non-invasive. Um, uh, nevertheless, with this kind of superficial tumor, when it's removed, um, even if it's successfully removed surgically, there is a high probability of recurrence, a very high probability. And this is because the remaining you know, tumor proximal or even cells distant from, from the site of the tumor have a, a much, they're more susceptible to the occurrence of a new tumor. And this is, this is recurrence, and this is the problem of recurrence. Um, another issue um, in bladder cancer is that um, non-invasive cancers, most of them at diagnosis, can progress to um, invasive cancer. And if you have an invasive bladder cancer, this usually means a major surgery, which carried out by one of my colleagues, which can be life-saving, but it's also life-changing. So how can we stop recurrence and progression? Um, my lab's approach to this is to learn more about the basic biology of bladder cancer. Um, and this actually begins with learning more or understanding as much as possible the basic biology of the bladder. And so um, beginning here um, with the lining of the bladder, what you have um, at the innermost lining, uh, the innermost surface, are these tightly linked very large cells called umbrella cells. And, they're, they're called umbrella cells because they shield the cells sitting underneath from the liquid wastes that accumulate in the bladder. Then you have a, a layer of intermediate cells and a layer of cells at the basal portion of the lining. We actually call them basal cells. They include the stem cells. Um, and these cells are very important in um, uh, providing renewal for the tissue. This is required because of day-to-day -day wear in the bladder or because of injuries that may occur. For example, urinary tract infections, which occur in about 10% of women annually. So these basal cells or stem cells um, are required um, to produce the other cell types in the bladder. And they're a bit really like um, a person with a liberal arts degree who is not yet specialized for a specific job, but could become eventually an attorney, a politician, a civil servant an artist, an entrepreneur, even a doctor or an engineer. So a stem cell is an unspecialized cell that can make cells that are specialized. Um, but a stem cell, to maintain this renewal capability, also has to make more of itself. So in the context of cancer, this sounds a little dangerous, right? A cell that makes more of itself. And indeed, it is dangerous. 
Um, we know, and I'll say more about this in a minute, that stem cells are actually the source of bladder cancers and of a number of other cancers as well. So how can we study this? Well, we need some, some, some really good tools to look at these things, and we have them in the mouse. Um, and one tool that we have to figure out what cells will do is to mark cells genetically and then to trace their fates. And so this is an example of that. This is the rainbow mouse. You can label cells with any of these four colors. This shows an example of a bladder muscle where cells are randomly uh, labeled with one of these four colors, but then that cell is permanently labeled and all of its progeny, all its descendants, will retain that color. So you can track that cell. Um, and uh, in the mouse, we also have a way to induce cancer. We give them in their drinking water a carcinogen like the carcinogens in, in uh, cigarette smoke, which are the major risk factor for bladder cancer. Okay? And after a certain uh, period of exposure to this carcinogen, we see this kind of thing um, in, in these mice. Uh, uh, we see that a single cell, a yellow cell here, has taken over the entire lining of the bladder. It has grown and spread. Um, this is another example, another mouse, another bladder, a different colored cell, blue here. But in both these cases, neither the yellow nor the blue cell has invaded to the tissues that lie underneath. After a bit longer exposure, in a different mouse, different bladder, different color here, you can see that these red cells, um, which are the cancer, have become invasive. They've taken over most of the bladder. And the nice thing about this model is that um, it very cleanly separates this early non-invasive stage from the later invasive stage, and that allows us to study this process. Um, okay, so that helps us with uh, studying um, uh, progression to invasion. Now, I said earlier that cancers come from basal stem cells. How do we know that? Well, again, this is, these are some of these powerful genetic tools. Genetic marking, again, we mark the basal cells um, in the lining of the bladder, which normally would make intermediate cells and umbrella cells. However, in this carcinogenesis model, um, what we see is that the tumors that arise are all the same color as that label, which means that they're arising from those labeled cells. Um, and that's how we know that these basal stem cells are giving rise to cancers, not only in the bladder, but in the colon, pancreas, and a number of other cancer types. So these are mouse studies. How do we learn about progression and recurrence in human bladder cancer? Well, I'm fortunate to have these wonderful colleagues and, and others in the department here who um, provide us with very precious uh, patient samples. And um, these are essential for, uh, for understanding how the human uh, biology works, the, the, the biology of human cancers work. And so to study progression, what we do is we compare non-invasive cancers to invasive cancers, okay? Makes sense, try to see what the differences are. Um, to study uh, recurrence, what we want to do is to compare a completely normal bladder tissue to a tissue that comes from a tumor adjacent part of the bladder or even tumor distant. Um, and we, this is a quote unquote normal or we call it sometimes apparent normal portion of the bladder. And by comparing these two, um, we can maybe understand why it is that that apparent normal tissue is so much more likely to produce a tumor than a, a normal tissue. How do we carry out these comparisons? Well, we've already heard about genomic approaches um, that uh, Pat Brown pioneered here at Stanford. Um, uh, things have actually evolved even further. We can look at, as, as Jim mentioned, the entire genome, thousands and thousands of genes all at once but we can look at them in individual cells, one cell at a time. And so we do this by um, a, t a technique called single cell RNA sequencing. And this is how we carry out these comparisons. And I just want to quickly show you an example of this. This is um, uh, a representation of 9,000 tumor and normal cells in one experiment. Um, and uh, each dot here, you see many dots, the software that um, works with these data is actually called Sura, the impressionist who uh, used pointillism to represent beautiful scenes, you know, at the beach or at a picnic. Um, so uh, each dot is a cell, and each cell um, uh, is associated with about 50,000 different RNA sequences. And what we can do is to use those sequences then to compare these cells to each other, and greater similarity is indicated by uh, proximity here. So 
Cells of the same type are clustered, and this big cluster up here, actually several different clusters, are all immune cells. Down here are cells of the blood vessel wall. I've circled here cells that come from the, um, the, the lining of the normal bladder. And then here are some cells from a tumor, which also arises from the lining of the bladder. You can see that they're clustered far apart because they're different. And in fact, we see differences in the clustering behavior of a tumor that's invasive and a tumor that's not invasive. Okay, so this is uh, single cell RNA sequencing. And we've applied this um, in order to study recurrence. We've applied this to normal bladder tissues and apparent normal bladder tissues um, that don't include tumor but come from a bladder where there has been a tumor. And so these red cells are the normal, the green cells are the apparent normal, and these are subclusters within those, um, those cells. And now if we look at, um, uh, okay, if we look at um, the expression of a gene, a specialization gene, um, which is indicated by the purple color here, you see that it's most prominently expressed in the normal cells and not much at all, really, in the apparent normal cells. On the other hand, if you look at a gene that indicates stem cell or basal character, you see that it's expressed at highest levels, the brightest purple here, in the apparent normal cells. And it's there, but not nearly as, at, at as high a level or in as many cells um, in the, um, the, nor the truly normal tissue. So. Um, could it be, is it possible, that the higher risk of uh, occurrence of a new tumor is because these apparent normal cells have greater basal or stem cell-like character? After all, I told you that it's stem, and I showed you that it's stem cells that are the source, the origin of these tumors. Um, and if that's true, if that were true, would it be possible to block or slow recurrence by reversing this basal character that these cells can acquire? Um, okay, so I've been showing you um, uh, these studies in the mouse, uh, in, in humans, I mean, now we need to go back to the mouse to try to answer these questions. Can we reverse basal, basal character acquisition, and does it help? So what we're doing here in, in the mouse is looking at two basal genes, never mind their names, one's in green, one's in red, um, and this is just a normal mouse. If we give them uh, another mouse, the carcinogen uh, that I talked about earlier, you can see that expression of both of these basal markers increases dramatically. But if we treat those mice with drugs, two drugs actually, that we chose because from our work and the work of others, we think that they, we thought that they might be able to reverse this, uh, the, the acquisition of this basal character. And indeed, that turns out to be true. So there's less green here um, in, in this with drug one, less green with drug two, less red, and so forth. And in this graph, you can see here, this is more than two genes now. This is just a, a, a whole set of genes um, that are considered together to create a basal score. These, this carcinogen-treated mice have a very high basal score, but that is reverted by treatment with these two drugs. So that looks interesting. What's happening with the bladders? Well, here you see normal bladders, um, uh, control bladders, and here you see bladders from a mouse that's treated with the carcinogen but no drugs. And these bladders are much bigger. You can see here that they weigh more. Um, and the red dots indicate that they are full of tumors. Um, these bladders here are from mice that were treated with the drugs, and those are these bars over here. They look much more like normal, and there are no tumors. So um, this is very interesting because drugs one and two act in the same biochemical pathway. So these results are mutually reinforcing, and because both of these drugs are FDA approved for treatments of other cancers, um, they could be used conceivably in trials with patients to see if we can block the recurrence of bladder cancers once you remove the initial cancer that's, that's seen at diagnosis. So we're very interested in carrying out this kind of trial. Um, we're also um, interested more broadly um, in obtaining this kind of information for every patient that comes in. Um, if we can collect these kinds of single cell data from apparent normal tissue and from tumor tissue, and then, of course, we have to treat the patients, and so we would deliver appropriate therapy based on clinical considerations. This would include surgical excision, perhaps BCG, which Joe has mentioned. Um, uh, maybe even if our trial works, specialization therapy. 
Um, another thing that we get out of this kind of single cell sequencing is that we may be able to select the appropriate immunotherapy. Um, immunotherapy has been very effective in a number of cancers, and it's just now uh, beginning to use uh, increasingly in bladder cancer, but it's not always clear whether it will work or which kind of immunotherapy should be used. We should be able to judge that based on the single cell RNA sequence. And so we'd like to collect all this data, correlate the treatments with outcomes for individual patients, and after we gather a certain amount of information, we're going to be able to devise an individualized treatment um, uh, plan for each patient when they come in at diagnosis based on this kind of very, very rich uh, data that we have uh, and that we can accumulate. So I'll, I'll end here by um, acknowledging Chris Prado, who's the newest uh, member of our department. He was just uh, offered a job as an assistant professor, which he has accepted, and he did the experiments in my lab with drug one and drug two that I discussed. Um, Hua and Shuo are here this evening, and they are postdoctoral fellows in my lab working on various aspects. Uh, I, I've only talked about a couple of the projects in the lab, but they're, they're part of the bladder team here. And Mallory is a, a graduate student who's also working um, on bladder as well. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions whenever. <laughs>